Hi everyone, uh, it's just about one o'clock, so uh, I'll just do a quick introduction uh, and then wait for some additional folks to come through and then we'll begin the presentation on financing your education. My name is Dennis Murphy. I am one of the associate directors in student financial services here on the Boston University Medical Campus. Uh, my office, Student Financial Services, handles financial aid for obviously the Department of Graduate Medical Sciences. We also award financial aid for the School of Medicine generally, uh, the School of Dental Medicine, the School and the School of Public Health as well. Our office uh, fully staffed, we are an office of nine people. We have individual liaisons for the specific departments. In the case of Graduate Medical Sciences, we will have an assistant director who is the sole liaison to Graduate Medical Sciences. But additionally, that person then has the support of our entire office. So I say all of that by way of, of saying, please reach out to us with questions and concerns. I have the chat function uh, available here. So if there are questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to uh, log on to the chat and ask those questions. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through the slides that we have prepared, but I do also like to leave time at the end if possible for any questions. Also on this slide, we have the information for Dr. Teresa Davies, who is uh, an assistant dean within Graduate Medical Sciences. Uh, Teresa is a, a wealth of knowledge and a terrific resource. In many cases, she may direct you right back to us. Uh, the contact information, best way to reach our office is by emailing OSFS-GMS at bu.edu. I've also added here our direct website bumc.bu.edu slash OSFS. That brings you right to the Student Financial Services homepage. From there, we have a number of different drop downs, uh, applying for aid, a breakdown of the overall cost of attendance, our various financial literacy topics, programs that we hold throughout the year. So I would start on that website. You may find many of the answers to your questions. Uh, pages that I will refer to throughout this presentation are all located there. This PowerPoint, as well as the presentation, will be available over the next week. Each of these links should be live. If you click on something and you find that it is uh, no longer a valid link, please email me and let me know. I want to make sure that everybody that's accessing this presentation is able to view all of that information. And at the bottom of the page, actually, before we move forward, you can see the link. This is a general graduate medical sciences link for financing options. Uh, again, either of these links, uh, we, we link to one another. So if you start with OSFS, you can get to the registration link and vice versa. So the first topic that I would like to cover is doctoral student funding. The goal for graduate medical sciences for our PhD candidates is to ensure that tuition, fees, and living expenses are covered. In the first year, graduate medical sciences, the department itself will offer tuition and fee scholarships, as well as living expense stipends and health insurance stipends. This will allow PhD candidates to study without having to really borrow financial aid. Uh, there are some loan options available, which we'll talk about in future slides, but for the most part, whenever possible, we are fully funding our PhD students. In the second year, there is a slight change. Funding will come from either the individual department or the program. There are additionally outside training grants, faculty research grants, there are federal grant programs, there are numerous options, I think is the, the shortest way to say this, numerous options for funding the second year and beyond. Additionally, there are scholarships, fellowships, and grants, as well as paid teaching and research opportunities, all of which may be available through the individual departments and programs. The effective date for the stipends, and I realize here this says September of 2019, in fact, the stipend effective date uh, would be September of 2020, and the uh, annual stipend amount is $35,000. Again, we have this uh, GMS students registration link located on this page as well. 
I mentioned additional types of financial aid for PhD candidates. There are numerous sources of funding. The first option that many students will look at after the institutional funding options have been exhausted, if a student still has a remaining balance, costs that they need to cover, many students will look at the FAFSA, which is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. In order to complete the FAFSA, you must be a US citizen, permanent resident, eligible and an eligible non-citizen or an eligible non-citizen and a candidate for a degree <clears throat> in order to receive financial aid. If you meet those qualifications, you can visit fafsa.ed.gov. They have also updated those federal links. You can also get to all of the federal pages by visiting studentaid.gov. They've recently rolled up all of the federal websites under that, under that one umbrella, studentaid.gov. The FAFSA is an online application that the federal government uses to establish a student's financial need. On the graduate level at this point, all of the loans that the federal government is awarding are called unsubsidized loans. That means that there is no interest subsidy. The Department of Education is not covering anybody's interest, which means from a student perspective, if you borrow an unsubsidized loan, the interest is accruing from day one. As of today, the direct loan interest rates uh, interest rate is 6.08. We'll also talk about graduate plus loan a little bit later. That interest rate is always 1% higher. So if the direct loan interest rate is 6.08% today, the graduate plus loan will be 7.08%. In order to be eligible for these loans, a student must complete the FAFSA every year. Additionally, we have a one-page internal institutional application called the Student Financial Services Graduate Medical Science Financial Aid Application. That is a WordPress form that exists on our website. It, in many cases, will take five minutes to complete. We're asking for your name, your Boston University ID, expected enrollment, and then from there you answer a series of yes or no questions. There's skip logic built into that page. So if you answer no to some questions, it may not let you proceed. If you have any questions on that process, please reach out to us and let us know. Again, that email address of OSFS dash gms at bu.edu is the best way to contact us. We also have a GMS financial aid application for students interested in enrolling in summer courses. That has actually just opened up. Uh, this wouldn't be applicable for anyone starting in September, but going forward into a second year, if someone is planning on taking courses for summer, we would need that SFS GMS summer application. An additional piece to qualifying for federal financial aid, students must be enrolled in at least six credits. There are some cases where uh, students, especially in the PhD program, if they are working on a, uh, a thesis or a dissertation, they may not actually be taking credit uh, courses for credit. In a case like that, the very good question. I will be, I'll come right back to the, the question on TA. Uh, for the full-time, uh, certified full-time status, this comes in when, when a student is working on their dissertation and they're not enrolled in actual credits. There is a form through the GMS Registrar's Office that a student would complete indicating, I'm not taking any credits, but I am still enrolled full-time working on a thesis or a dissertation. This certified full-time status allows my office to award federal direct loans for any, uh, any amount of tuition and fees and then living expenses as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, the certified full-time form is an additional uh, way to qualify for federal financial aid. An additional piece, uh, the courses that are being taken must pertain to the degree that the student is pursuing. There may be cases where a student takes an elective outside of graduate medical sciences, provided that that, cre that course, those credits count toward the degree itself, a student can receive financial aid for that course. That the registrar for graduate. All students must be making satisfactory academic progress. This is a specific GMS, uh, GMS requirement, uh, sorry, GPA requirement that students will need to meet uh, in order to maintain financial aid. That information is available on uh, our website as well as on the Graduate Medical Science website. Um, so 
before I move on to the next slide, there was one question that was asked here. Are there opportunities to become TAs in specific departments that would help with aid or housing? Uh, the answer is yes, but it depends on the individual department. So our office, Student Financial Services, exists almost at the end of an assembly line. So the departments will make individual decisions on funding, whether that is uh, a teaching assistant, research assistant, uh, student employment, any of those decisions then get communicated to my office with specific funding assignments. We then key that information onto a student's account. Uh, so uh, for Dev, the, the answer is possibly, it depends. It would be determined through the individual department and from there, they will let us know. So moving on to financial aid for master's students. So some of this is a little bit of repeat information. Uh, in order to qualify for the federal direct unsubsidized loan as a master's student, you still need to complete the FAFSA. Uh, you would also need to complete the SFS GMS application. On the master's level, the federal loan limit for the direct unsubsidized loan is $20,500. This is the standard loan that the Department of Ed issues by completing the FAFSA. Every graduate student is eligible for $20,500 of direct unsubsidized loan. As I mentioned earlier, the word unsubsidized literally means there is no interest subsidy. So when a student receives the direct unsubsidized loan, there's half of the loan, 10250 uh, 10, that's dispersed in the fall semester. That begins accruing interest on day one. Then in spring, fast forward to January, when the spring semester begins, the second $10,250 is dispersed. So at that point, students have interest accruing on the full $20,500. We will look at the tuition costs for the, the GMS programs in a slide or two, but if you've looked at the cost of attendance page on our website, you'll know that 20,500 is not going to cover all of the costs. If students are in the lucky position to be able to fund the remaining tuition, living expenses, personal expenses out of pocket, many students will only borrow that 20,500 and then use their own personal funding to supplement the rest. Many students are not able to do that. And we in this office completely understand that there are going to be students in GMS that need to use federal financial aid dollars to cover all of their costs. That's tuition, fees, room and board, personal expenses, transportation, and books and supplies. In that case, students would need to look at an additional loan, either the direct plus for graduate and professional borrowers, also called the graduate plus loan, or a private loan. Both of these loans are credit-based, meaning there is a credit check as part of the application. Each of these loans can be borrowed up to the full cost of attendance to cover all of those expenses, tuition, fees, living expenses. The major difference between a direct graduate plus loan and private graduate student loans is the originator of the loan. With federal loans, there are some benefits, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, flexible repayment plans are one, a fixed interest rate is another. If a student borrowed federal loans during their undergraduate time and then they move into a master's degree and they borrow the direct unsubsidized loan as well as the graduate plus loan, they've stuck with all federal funding, which means when they enter repayment, they can sign up for an income-driven repayment plan. The income-driven repayment plan takes all of those federal loans, whether they're undergraduate, graduate, direct, graduate plus, they put them all in one bucket and they base the monthly payment on the borrower's salary. So regardless of how much money you borrowed for undergraduate, how much you borrowed for the master's degree, there may be students who have future plans beyond the master's degree, whether that is a PhD, an MD or so on, and they may be looking at borrowing federal financial aid for those programs as well. Borrowing all federal funds allows the student to sign up for an income-driven repayment plan where the determination for the monthly payment is based on income and not on the overall balance. For example, somebody earning $60,000 a year who borrowed all federal funds is gonna pay $345 a month 
regardless of the balance, the total balance of loans that they owe. When a salary jumps up to say $100,000 a year, that monthly payment would increase to $680 a month. And it would track throughout the borrower's career. As the salary increases, the monthly payments increase. This is a nice option if you expect lower salary at the beginning and uh, increasing salary as you move through your career. The downside to the federal loans is that there is what's called an origination fee. The origination fee is deducted from the loan before they even send us the money. So for example, the unsubsidized loan of 20,500 has a 1% fee. The Department of Education deducts that money before they even send us that unsubsidized loan. If it's a $20,500 loan, the school is actually only going to receive $20,282 per year or $10,141 per semester. The difference is that origination fee, which the Department of Education keeps. The unsubsidized loan origination fee is 1%. The graduate plus loan origination fee is 4%. So if somebody needed to receive $10,000 of Graduate PLUS loan, they have to borrow $10,440 of Graduate PLUS loan. The Department of Education keeps that 440, the school receives 10,000. The private loans don't have these origination fees. With the private loans, depending on your credit and the credit of a cosigner, if you apply with one, you might be able to get a lower interest rate than the 7.08% of the direct loan, uh, the direct graduate plus loan, sorry. The downside to the private loans is that when you enter repayment, that's going to be a separate monthly payment from any federal loans that a student borrows. So depending on the loan balance you need to borrow, what your plans are after the master's degree, one loan versus the other may make more sense. We do not expect anyone to make this decision on their own, nor should they make this decision quickly this early in the process. The important thing is to know that these are available options and then reach out to us, email osfs-gms, explain your situation and we can guide you. We cannot advise, but we can provide a little bit more depth to the pros and cons that I've listed of the two loans. Again, the unsubsidized loan interest rate right now is 6.08%. The graduate plus loan is 7.08%. The rates change every July 1st. So we don't yet know what the interest rate will be for those of you starting in September of 2020. Those rates will be released generally in mid-May. Once my office has those, we try to notify all continuing and incoming students of what the next set of interest rates will look like. Then you can compare what the graduate plus loan interest rate is with any potential private loan that you're applying for. So that is a very brief description of the loan options available. There are very few scholarships offered to master students within GMS. The largest scholarship awarded is the GMS Provost Scholarship, which is relayed to my office based on the recommendation of the program director. We then receive a spreadsheet of everyone who is receiving the Provost Scholarships and we post those to an individual student's account. So if you get the Provost Scholarship, that's going to cut down on the amount of loans that you would necessarily need to apply for. Many students, if we haven't received the Provost Scholarship information, many students will apply for the loans ahead of time, cover their full costs with, I don't know, the unsubsidized and the Graduate Plus. Then we can reduce those loans once we're notified of the Provost Scholarship. So sometimes you end up planning for the worst and then we make uh, adjustments as we go. Uh, the question that was asked, is the Provost Scholarship awarded to incoming students? Yes, it is. Uh, again, those decisions, they're not made by my office, but uh, they would be made by the individual program director. And then uh, the program directors would communicate that information to my office. But um, yes, uh, any incoming master's student would be considered for the Provost Scholarship. Whether a student is offered the scholarship, that's gonna depend on the program itself. Lastly, there are student worker positions available, whether that is BU student employment or federal work study. Those positions are limited and the federal funding around the federal work study is also limited, but it is something to be aware of. Those options are available. So I mentioned that we would talk about the costs. One thing to know, the numbers that you're looking at right here 
are estimated costs based on the 1920, uh, sorry, 2020, 2019, 2020 academic year. Every year, tuition generally increases between three and 4%. This is the tuition that is being charged to students in the current semester, the 27,360. That's for full-time tuition. The, I will come back to that provost scholarship question in one moment. Uh, the full-time tuition is 27,360. Some students may elect to enroll part-time, at which point the credits or the, the tuition is determined on a per credit basis. 1,710 is the current, uh, current per credit tuition. Once a student gets above 11 credits, the tuition charge goes right to the 27,360 full-time tuition. You can also see on this chart room and board. So for this academic year, we build in $7,095 per semester, assuming that would be enough to cover rent, utilities, and groceries for a given student. If you find you don't need all of that money, you don't need to borrow loans to cover the full room and board. This is just our allowance. It's what we build into the cost of attendance in the hope that uh, that everyone has enough funding. Additionally, here we list out the current costs for the health insurance, the basic and the plus plan. Those amounts will also change going into next year. Uh, the question that was asked was, uh, can a student apply for provost scholarship before the decision is made? To my knowledge, and again, the provost scholarship being handled through the individual department, I believe all applicants are considered for the provost scholarship and that there is not uh, a separate application, but for questions on the Provost Scholarship, I would recommend reaching out to uh, the program specifically. Whichever program you're applying to, uh, on the GMS website, there are individual email addresses for the different programs. I would reach out to those folks directly just to make sure you're getting the most accurate information from the beginning. So, Here's just some additional information on the financial aid process. You can see on the right-hand side, I've included the same chart from the previous slide. Um, ah, another question. Do we offer health insurance waiver due to financial hardship? In the state of Massachusetts, everyone is required to have health insurance, uh, whether that's the institution's health insurance or uh, a state program, but there is the ability through BU Student Health Services to waive health insurance if you have a plan that meets the qualifications. The website for student health services is bu.edu slash SHS. I don't have that embedded anywhere in this presentation. So again, that's bu.edu slash SHS. Student health services will be able to answer all of the specific health insurance questions. If a student waives the health insurance, we can see on the account that that has been removed and we make sure that that's not being included in any of the charges or the overall cost of attendance uh, because we don't want someone borrowing funding unnecessarily. Okay, so first things first, you wanna complete the FAFSA. Bear with me a moment, there is a fire truck going through uh, right below me, there we go. Uh, you complete the FAFSA on studentaid.gov and that can be done at any time. Incoming students, uh, well, for all students really, we're looking at two year prior data. So for the fall of 2020, we're looking at 2018 taxes. Theoretically, everybody who needed to file 2018 taxes has already done so. Meaning you can go in and complete the FAFSA today if you wanted to. Once the FAFSA is submitted, including the BU school information, we receive it in about five to seven business days. Uh, additionally, and I'm skipping to the third large bullet point here, uh, students will wanna complete the SFS GMS financial aid application. That's a web form page, uh, WordPress web form on our website that literally asks for your name, your BUID, the number of credits that you're expected to be enrolled in. And then there's a series of yes or no questions that runs through a, basically a skip logic. If you answer no to some of the questions, it won't let you proceed. It's designed that way to make sure that you've gone through essentially a checklist of items. So once you've completed the FAFSA and the GMS financial aid application, the next question is whether or not you need to apply for either a private loan or the Graduate PLUS loan. And like I mentioned before, this is not an easy decision. 
in many cases, this is the first time you're making a decision like this, first time you're applying for a credit-based loan. So this is where we want folks to reach out and have these conversations with us. Whether you give us a call, uh, the direct office number, and I realize that was not on the first slide, so I apologize, to reach our office, if you call 617-358-6550, you'll come right to our front desk. We always have someone on duty as our primary coverage, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, depending on the call volume, someone may ask you to hold for a bit and then we'll pick up the call. But the idea is we want everyone to feel comfortable whether you are walking in uh, as a, a local or calling in from, uh, calling in remotely, uh, we always have somebody on duty to assist. So that's the private loan. And the last point here is that new tuition rates for the 2020-2021 year will generally be posted in April. The overall tuition charges are, oh yes, I will repeat the phone number. It is 617-358-6550. 617-358-6550. So the tuition rates are generally released in April. Uh, the Once the trustees have reviewed all of the tuition information, they'll share that with us and then we release it out to the students. The other budget items, things like uh, room and board, books and supplies, our office works on uh, compiling that information based on uh, national and local averages and individual, in the case of books and supplies, individual department costs, and then we will release all of that together as what's called the cost of attendance. So just to review some quick steps here, electronically file the FAFSA. So this page lists fafsa.ed.gov. The Department of Ed has rolled all of their websites up under the next link here, studentaid.gov. But even if somebody enters fafsa.ed.gov, you'll get to the FAFSA. Um, the school code to enter BU's information is 002130. And please note, for all graduate students, you are independent. Therefore, we do not require parental income information on the FAFSA, which should make it a nice, quick, and easy process. If you filed taxes in 2018, you can always use the IRS data retrieval tool, pull all of your financial aid or your financial information into the FAFSA, and then submit that. Then the next thing that you would look at, once you've done the FAFSA and that GMS application, there are gonna be some additional documents students need to complete in order for the loans to disperse. So on studentaid.gov, there is entrance counseling and master promissory notes that need to be completed. Entrance counseling is a tutorial, an online tutorial that basically walks you through your rights and responsibilities as a student loan borrower. The promissory note is your contract with the Department of Education. It says, this is who I am, this is where I'm going to school, please pay my school the federal loans and I agree to repay the Department of Education and my loan servicer after I graduate. If you're taking the direct loan and the Federal Graduate Plus loan, there's one entrance counseling that encom encompasses everything, but there would be two separate master promissory notes, one for the direct unsubsidized loan and one for the direct Graduate Plus loan. This is because the terms and conditions of those loans are different. So we also have a Graduate Plus application. It's a paper application that's here in our office. If that's the direction you choose to go for the September start, please reach out to us. Uh, we can direct you to the website. The form is also available there under our loans page. And the last piece, private loan options that are available, we have listed on our website. We have a list of what we call our preferred lenders. It's not the end all be all. If you find a private student loan out there that gives you an interest rate that, that you like and you wanna use that lender, just let us know and make sure that the lender has our information. They'll very likely send us a check directly. We'll work with the student accounting office on the Charles River campus to make sure that that money is posted to your account. For international students, there are unfortunately no federal financial aid options, but I encourage all international students to reach out to your uh, country of origin, and look for options there. There may be some cases where the, the country itself or a province within the country may offer some kind of educational loan to study in the United States. 
We do have private loans that are available for international students. Many of our preferred lenders require a US citizen or a permanent resident with good credit as a co-signer, but there are loans, specifically Empower and Prodigy, that will offer loans to international students without a US citizen co-signer, the difficulty being that they limit the amount of loans. The lifetime limit is generally between fifteen and $30,000. So that is an option, but it may not necessarily cover all of the costs. One thing to bear in mind, international students must provide estimated expenses for one year of tuition. Questions on that process, as well as the visa process, should be directed to the International Student and Scholars Organization, or bu.edu slash ISSO. OK, we're just about at time but I've still got the chat open and I don't mind staying for a little bit if there are additional questions. Uh, this recording, as well as the PowerPoint, will be available online subsequently. So uh, that phone number, 617-358-6550, will be available. Um, but again, the first page, we have that email address of osfs or hyphen gms at bu.edu. Uh, for right now, I'm on the other end of that email. Uh, I will be answering those for the next little bit. Uh, very soon, we will have an assistant director hired who will be a liaison specifically to graduate medical sciences for our office. In the interim, uh, myself and my colleagues here in this office are chipping in to assist. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We know that this can be a complicated process, the different types of loan applications, the interest rates, the repayment terms. It can feel complicated, but if we can talk through the discussions, my experience is many students feel a lot better. Uh, we also try to hold robust financial literacy sessions throughout the academic year. So we have a, a fair in September that where we bring in many outside organizations to come and speak on financial literacy. Yes, uh, the email address is O as in office, S as in student, F as in financial, S as in services, hyphen, G as in graduate, M as in medical, S as in sciences, at bu.edu. So it's our office, Office of Student Financial Services, hyphen, GMS for graduate medical sciences, at bu.edu. So I just wanna thank you all for attending this session of today's virtual fair. Again, we will make sure that this session is posted online, but if anyone has any questions along the way, don't hesitate to send us an email and let us know. Thank you very much. Have a good day.